welcome all to uh, Macquarie Business School uh, and to our beautiful Angel Place campus. Can I start by acknowledging that we meet today on the land of the Gadigal people uh, uh, of the Aurora Nation and to pay my respects to elders past and present. Well, it's fantastic to be able to welcome you all here tonight uh, for the last of our uh, Macquarie Business School networking sessions uh, on the theme of AI in finance, uh, the future is already here. These events, as many of you will know, are specifically for our MBA students, our GMBA, our Global MBA students, and our Masters of Applied Finance students, and the alumni to those programs. And so it's wonderful to have you all here today uh, to be able to meet and talk about this topic. Um, Lindsay Bryan, our Associate Dean uh, for Postgraduate Programs, is going to lead today's event. We have um, Sam Stewart uh, and Julian King, who are both joining us uh, with their expertise in financial services and AI. Um, so, Lindsay, I might uh, invite you to come up and start the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Eric, and thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, it's great to see you all here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, so to introduce myself, I am the Associate Dean for Postgraduate um, Studies and uh, the three courses that were mentioned are part of my remit. So I'm very pleased to see some students and alumni from all of those programs here today. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, our panelists um, and they, as Eric mentioned, Sam Stewart, who is Senior Partner and Managing Director at Boston Consulting Group and Julian King, Managing Director and Partner at Boston Consulting Group X. And I'm told that the X doesn't mean that he's on Twitter all day. Um, now, unfortunately, Lee Hatton was going to join us, but is unwell and is unable to attend. We, she's lost her voice. And we decided that interpretive mime wasn't going to work for this session. So um, unfortunately, she can't join us. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to do is to say that we um, are really keen to hear your questions. Obviously, we have some things that we want to talk about. Um, but we want to get your questions as well. So we're using Mentimeter to collect those questions. Um, and you will see around the place, dotted around the place, many QR codes, including on that screen right there. So um, what we need you to do is to take that supercomputer in your pocket or the mobile phone, uh, scan that QR code, visit the website, um, and that takes you to the current slider where you can submit questions. Uh, you don't need to wait for the Q&A. As you think of a question, please put it in there. Um, we'll go through the questions. You're encouraged to view them, uh, upvote other questions. Um, if you find that someone has asked you a question, upvote that. And obviously, we'll um, be looking at the questions as we go through to see what we can bring into the audience. The other thing we'd encourage is that if you have a question, you want to ask it yourself, um, and you want to ask that question um, yourself, please include your name, and we'll ask you to um, ask the question um, directly. Um, so before we get started with the panel, let's get you thinking about the topic. Um, we asked Bing Chat for some analogies for generative AI in finance and received some interesting, interesting responses. So the first one is which of these um, do you think explains uh, or is an analogy for generative AI and which is the best one? So um, the first one is it's like a chef creating new dishes from existing ingredients or recipes. It combines different elements or, of data or content to produce new ones that satisfy some criteria or purpose. It's a mouthful. A magician that create, uh, creating illusions from reality. It uses existing data or content as a source and manipulate it in ways that are surprising and convincing. Uh, it's a composer creating new music from existing notes or melodies. It uses existing data or content as an inspiration, generating new sounds and rhythms that match some style or mood. Or uh, a gardener creating new plants from seeds or cuttings. It uses existing data or content as a seed and grow it into different shapes and colours that suit some environment or purpose. And the final one is a writer creating new stories from existing characters or plot plots. It uses existing data as a framework to generate new events and dialogues that make the story more interesting and engaging. So have a think, vote via Mentimeter. We will come back to this after the Q&A and we'll give you the results as we go, but as you will be able to see from uh, the results that are coming up now already, we're starting to get some answers, which is great. So let's uh, kick off the panel. Um, I will invite Sam and Julian to come up on stage and join me and then we'll uh, start kick off our session. We'll just make sure our microphones are on and everyone can hear us. Excellent, thank you. Um, so 
Sam, Julian, can I ask each of you to just give a brief introduction and you, with your experience and the area of interest? That would be great. Um, sure. So Sam Stewart, um, as is mentioned, I'm a senior partner at BCG uh, in Sydney. Um, my experience is much more on the um, the finance side than on the AI side. So hopefully Julian and I, you know, can do a, a reasonable um, double act. Um, within um, our firm, so I've been at BCG actually for 22 years. I, I came to BCG straight from uh, from law school. Um, I've also done an MBA. Uh, and in, the, in my time there, I've, I've mostly worked for, for banks and insurance companies. Um, and most recently, I led uh, BCG's uh, you know, retail banking practice globally, including during COVID. So ask me any questions you have, obviously. Hopefully, I can bring a perspective on how banks in Australia and elsewhere are thinking about the topic. Thanks, Sam. Julian. Hi, everyone. Julian King. So I'm a partner at BCG. Been with BCG for about eight years now. Uh, had a bit of an interesting career path. I started out doing a PhD in astrophysics at UNSW. After that, I did uh, actually worked in M&A advisory for a couple of years and did uh, $20 billion worth of M&A deals. Uh, wanted to do much more quantitative stuff that was more linked to my PhD. So I ended up at, B at uh, BCG as part of the analytics team being set up in 2015. Um, I work in uh, kind of FI, insurance, telco, and then a smattering of other things. I'm also the generative AI topic lead for BCG for Australia and New Zealand. We, we like having Julian because we can legitimately say we have a rocket scientist um, on, our, on our team. And he's also someone that works directly in AI, which is exactly what we need right now. So um, that's great. So um, to kick off things, and as I said, please do make sure that you pop your questions into Mantimeter. We will be working through those as we go. Um, to kick us off, um, we really want to talk a little bit, set some ground rules or some base rules, if you like. What is AI and what is it? Is what we're seeing today genuinely AI? In a recent Freakonomics episode, Adam Davidson from NPR examined AI over three parts, and I'll quote him here. Artificial intelligence is not the right term for the current generation of what we have all come to call AI. The word intelligence suggests that there is some active process of thought but that is not what ChatGPT or any program is doing. All it is doing is taking in information and using a lot of mathematics to predict what information comes next. The pros call it machine learning. So to what extent, Julian, do you agree with that? I mean, I think people feel this sort of existential threat to themselves personally from generative AI. The way that people talk about it, like you hear things like, oh, but like it made a mistake, like somehow people don't make mistakes. Or I've heard, yeah, but is it going to win a Nobel Prize for inventing that, like the next theory in physics? Like people set this sort of very unreasonably high bar, I think, for whether it's doing smart things because they feel personally challenged. Like maybe it's going to eat into part of their job. I mean, you can put first year university physics problems into it and it will solve them. So clearly it's very good at some things. It makes mistakes in a different way that people do, but like clearly it's useful and works quite well on a lot of tasks. So. I think it's in, at least somewhat intelligent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's, it's the, um, we're having this discussion as well, it's almost a philosophical question of, you know, what does human intelligence provide other than a sensible response to inputs? Um, you know, at some level, there's really no difference. I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure it's really the right question. The, the right question is, is it useful? Yeah. And, I, and it is, I think. And I think that's one of the things is that um, the, the premise of today's session is that well, we've been using essentially AI in finance for quite some time. And the examples I gave in the, the topic header, which is you know credit cards, it's been a business which is dominated by algorithms and, and computer programming. So is it something that's just been out there and nobody's known about? I think it's the accessibility of chat GPT which has kicked it off. Mm. So everyone who's been in the field has known like of the development of the algorithms for some time, but sudden previously you needed data scientists and specialists to be able to craft the algorithms in a way that was useful. Now you've got something where you can just put a chat window wrapper around it and it's suddenly accessible to everyone. So you know if you go and ask uh, like company executives and board directors have they used it a lot of them have and that shows the appeal because if you ask them have they built an AI model Almost none of them have. Yeah. And so where else has it been used, Sam, I mean, in finance that you've come across? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, there are lots of use cases and I'd say um, every bank or insurance company in the world is experimenting in some way with, with some use case. Um, I mean, it's typically the most um, common use cases, at least at the moment, in regulated industries 
typically don't involve interacting directly with customers. So typically there's a human employed by the bank or insurance company that, that vets or is in some way in the loop um, with respect to whatever is being generated, um, which I think is appropriate given you know how new it is. Uh, and then the other kind of dimension, I guess, would be, and again, it's in the name, it's the generative aspect of it. So it's better at, it's it, where it's new is in creating creating a document or a new insight. The analytical part of it, as you say, has been used for years and years and is not really that new. So, um, you know, good examples would be if a, if a bank has a new um, corporate client, they need to do due diligence on the directors of the company, you know, rather than having, you know, an army of people basically just doing Google searches on company directors. Um, that's It's very, very easy and efficient to get um, a generative AI tool to, to do the first version of the summary. Um, where it's, I think, probably less useful or less immediately useful is in directly interacting with customers, at least in regulated industries, as I said. Um, you know, the one example that, um, you know, there's this, this whole problem of the um, lack of financial literacy in Australia and what's known as the advice gap. So because it's, in a regulatory sense, quite hard for companies to provide financial advice, the question is, well, could we get a machine to do it? We've done, you know, run sort of experiments with our clients. Um, you know, typically it costs, say, three and a half thousand dollars to pro to produce a statement of advice, which is way more than what most people are prepared to pay for it. Um, you can probably do it for a tenth of that cost using using a generative AI tool. Um, but I think we're still a step in Australia. You know, it's still have another step to go before we'd be happy to kind of let that loose on on customers. And I think there's there's a lot of work being done on robo advice, which is really what we're talking about here. But it really, at the moment, it comes down to simply having a bunch of questions that people answer, and it has a form of answer for each of those questions. If we were to go to the extent of having true robo advice, that would be where there'd be no one really overlooking it or you know being part of that process. Yeah, I mean the interesting thing is, and we've again done some sort of experiments with with clients here. Is is um. For example, creating a robo advice tool that only refers to documents that have previously been vetted, so product disclosure statements, for example, you know, or only links to real time data that we're confident is accurate. Um, and you can create tools that do that, and I think it's um, useful. But even if even if the tool is only referring to documents that you're confident are right. Um, it can still draw the wrong inferences, even even in that situation. And so, at least, and Julian, you probably disagree. I think you actually do disagree on this point. Um, at least for the foreseeable future, I think there will still be humans in some way involved in that. So, Julian, on that, do you think it is possible to get to get to that stage? I mean, I think what Sam was describing before, effectively, robo advice for advisors, is the big unlock because it won't require really a change in the regulatory framework. You'll still have the advisor giving the you know the tick of approval or making modifications as necessary, there is a big step required from a regulatory perspective in order to have direct to customer personalised advice, even if it's more powerful. So I expect what will happen is we'll see a kind of indirect pathway towards it there. And I think that's an interesting point because I know when um, the first use of machine learning or, or algorithms in financial markets trading, the really big problem became not how to actually get it going. We could get it going, we could get it to work and it would do things that it was supposed to do. But if it all went wrong, who actually did the deal? If we breached the credit limit, who did the deal? Um, and I guess that's going to be the issue, isn't it? Who gave the advice if robo advice give, advisor gives the advice and it proves to be wrong? Is someone going to be held accountable? And where, where does that lie? So the, count, the counterpoint to the point I just made is um, it probably already gives better advice than the average financial advisor. Um, and actually all financial advisors are doing is basically getting listening to what you're saying, listening out for the 10 pieces of information they feel that they need to collect in order to give one of kind of five generic responses. So that, you know, so you could have, and the, you know, one of Julian's colleagues teases me about this, is like when, when cars were first invented, the rule was you needed to have someone run in front of the car with a white flag in case someone didn't know what the car was and accidentally ran in front of it. Um, and anyway, so the, the counter argument to what I just said is, look, 
eventually we'll realise that we don't need the person with the white flag running in front of the car um, and we'll look back in 20 years' time and people that said what I just said will look like dinosaurs. Um, I honestly don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess people that said what Julian said start to look like heroes, yeah. Well, either that or the whole thing collapses and then I look like the genius. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, the, the point is I think it's, it is a genuinely open question and I think people need to engage not just on the algorithm or the technology but on the either the business process or the ethical consequences, you know, in insurance, for example, um, or actually even in banking, um, you know, ensuring that there aren't inadvertently, um, uh, you know, biases mm. in the model that we would never accept from a human. I think there's a whole bunch of interesting, important business, ethical, operational questions um, that actually are more difficult to think through often than the technology itself. And I think one of the other things that's interesting is that I know there was a recent AFR Boss article where they interviewed a number of business leaders. And I reckon that just about every one of them mentioned two things, commer customised commercial marketing um, and fraud protection. So what are the things we're talking about here, Julian? What are they actually doing? Yeah, so I mean, in general, across all organisations, there's a set of use cases which everyone is pursuing, one of which includes customised marketing, uh, also includes things like knowledge management, contact centres, uh, there's a couple of others there. So the customised marketing is basically, um, we know that personalising communications with customers works very well, both because it's more relevant to them, but also it demonstrates that the information that uh, financial institutions hold about them is being used as part of the process. So the challenge historically has actually been, how do you make enough content? Like you've got a whole bunch of marketers making stuff and they can there's a limit to how fast they can make it. And so most banks and financial institutions have been constrained in their ability to get really personalised because it's very expensive from a content side. So what everyone is hoping here is that you can generate content using generative AI much more scalably uh, and therefore you can be more personalised. Uh, on the fraud side, um, part of this is about processing text and images and audio and video in a way that then augments the existing risk models. Uh, you know, so if you have... Um, like uh, you know, a car insurer, for instance, and you've been in, in, in an accident and you, you send photos of it, actually having the AI analyse the images to understand whether there's likely to have been certain patterns which might be fraudulent there. There's a specific piece on synthetic data generation to train the models, but that's a sort of a bit of a, a side thing. The challenge, of course, on fraud is that actually uh, the tools are available to the people on the other side. So I know everyone gets uh, crappy scam emails in broken English and you go, oh, that's not that hard to see like very quickly, all of the scam emails are going to get very, very good. So there's a bit of an arms race on the fraud side. I think we're already yeah. seeing it, aren't we? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we, just, we were discussing before the, um, the session, you know, um, one of the things, for example, that um, uh, an insurance um, client in the US is doing is um, predictively analysing which of their customers uh, is likely to go to litigation. You know, there's a big problem in the US of... Um, it depends which side of the fence you sit on, but of, of, of lawyers drumming up business, you know, there's, there's examples of um, even before the hurricane has hit, the lawyers have put up websites saying, you know, hurricane X, you know, please contact lawyer Y. Um, so insurers in the US are experimenting with using these tools to identify which of their customers they think is likely to go to litigation and then trying to kind of head that off at the pass, um, which is obviously good that the, the the kind of flip side is the lawyers can also use those tools and so, or, or a complainant, like a frivolous complainant, for example, the, the, it currently takes quite a lot of time to make a complaint, for example, to AFCA if you're a consumer and, and that's, you know, a bad thing in some cases but a good thing in that it would probably weeds out mm. frivolous complaints. The cost of lodging a frivolous complaint is now effectively zero. Mm. So I think you're right. There's, there'll be an arms race. I think it's, it's sort of unclear exactly where it will land on some of those examples. And to Julian's point, we're actually seeing, you know, I, I see uh, countless phishing emails every day and they are getting better. Um, and the only protection we've got at the moment is you can see the website that it came from or the email address that it came from. But, yeah, it's getting harder and harder to, to avoid those. Them and the text messages, which apparently are the most lucrative form of fraud. Well, I mean, the other thing also, obviously, is the um, moving from just text to speech to um, images um, we, you know that whole question about how do you verify that something is 
real. I mean, another example actually from banking would be, um, you know, some banks get you to use your voice to identify yourself through the app. Um, and my understanding, you correct me, is is that the, um, you know, voice copying software is now at a point where essentially that's no longer a good biometric measure for banks to use. Right. So we've still got our thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it's easier to fake someone's thumb or their voice. <laughs> no, they just chop it, chop it off, don't they? Yeah, um, that's it's all very um, entertaining, but yeah. Um, so one of the things I think that is interesting is that a lot of the things that people talk about now, and you've you've alluded to this, they're very back office. Um, they're not really front and centre. Um, is the next generation of AI heading towards being that advisor itself? Is it heading to be the interaction with customers? Um, what are you seeing on that front? So I think it's probably going to be uh, evolution more than revolution. So roughly we see AI or Gen AI impacting in three ways. So one is kind of Gen AI everywhere, which is stuff that will be available through vendor offerings like Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe, etc. That will quickly get implemented, but everyone will have it, so it's not a competitive advantage. There's then transforming functions within organisations. And so this is like transform marketing, transform um, IT, transform legal, et cetera. Everyone is starting on back office processes because there's human in the loop. Your dirty laundry is not hanging out in the public domain. Uh, you know, anything you put in terms of chat, you'll have people actively trying to attack it and break it. Yep. So it's just felt to be the right place to start because it's both easy and safe. The third piece is then kind of building unicorns or competitive advantage like the wealth advisory piece. Yeah. But yes, it's everyone's starting there because it's safe. Yeah. Or safer. Yeah, look, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I mean, no one really knows, honestly. But you'd have to assume that at some point it then crosses the line. People are comfortable enough with it. You know, if it works internally, if our staff, you know, it actually performs better than our staff on lots of different dimensions. It, it I imagine it won't take that long before it then starts being used um, with with consumers. Um, I have to say the examples I've seen so far are pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a good example. I, I, I can't remember the name of the company. There's, a, there's an insurer in, in Europe that launched a, um, you know, a customer-facing chatbot. Um, and you could ask it, you know, will I be covered for this? You know, do you have pet insurance? You know, my apartment's on the fourth floor, you know, all this sort of stuff. If you play around with it, it honestly only takes five minutes and it starts giving you crazy answers. You know, it switches from English to German. It, you know, it's absolutely hopeless. And you could imagine as a, and maybe it'll learn, I, you know, I assume it does, but you could imagine if you were the director of a, an insurance company that had something publicly available to customers that was saying crazy things about the policies that you sold, um, you would shut that down pretty quickly. I was going to say, I mean, as soon as something goes out there that has the wrong information or is incorrect, it's kind of the end for, for the moment for everything, isn't it? Um, so no one really wants to do it. Thankfully, banks never put out incorrect information. <laughs> never, never. Of course, they wouldn't. I mean, there is an interesting analogy of the self-driving car, and I, like it genuinely, I think is an interesting ethical question. Which is, um, so on average, self-driving cars are safer, um, but when one of them crashes, we feel that, for whatever reason, to be much more significant than an individual person making a mistake and crashing. Um, and I think as a society, we're just not at the point where we're willing to say, you know, on average, it's okay uh, if the machine is, you know, does have harmful effects. And I suspect that to a certain extent, there's an element of if someone's driving the car, there is someone to blame. If the car does it itself, it's very hard to work out who to blame. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's interesting. That, that's the existential threat to um, motor insurance. Yeah. Um, because if you're not driving, you're not responsible. And if you're never responsible, then you don't need insurance. And so the question is, who who is responsible? And therefore, you know, car insurance is the biggest, most profitable line of insurance for Australian auto, Australian insurance companies. Um, it could be that actually either the manufacturers at fault or the software provider is at fault, or maybe there's some public, you know, scheme that insures everyone and we kind of decide that it's no one's fault. Um, but I do think that's a really important question yep. to answer. It is indeed. And I think one of the other things that everyone will focus on, and we alluded to this the, the whole session, is what are the jobs that are you know, likely to disappear out of this round of 
Industrial Revolution. So I, I have a particular view on that. I, I, I quite like that line of, you know, the internet is visible everywhere except in productivity statistics. Um, I'm, I'm sure you disagree, Julian, but I, I think there's at least a chance that this has a bit of that flavour. Um, and then I, again, personal view, but I think if you look over the history of human progress, technological advancement has been a benefit and, you know, roughly speaking, as many jobs get created as, 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 um, as a, you know, removed. This one could be different. This, you know, this could be different to the industrial revolution. It could be different to electricity. It could be different to the internet. Um, my guess is it'll probably be some, something similar. And certainly, you know, if I look back at the beginning of my career in banking, there were things called batch operators who coded, encoded checks and none of that exists today. So, you know, it does happen. Julian, did you have a... Yeah, so if you remember the, the cartoon, The Jetsons, you know, it's, it's quite old now, but you might remember that George Jetson's job was to go to work and push a button uh, because everything else had been automated. And sometimes he complained that his job was too onerous because he had to push the button up to three times per hour. Uh, you can check this on Wikipedia. Um, so, uh, I mean, like everyone works just as hard as they did 30 or 40 years ago, but the work has moved on to other things. So I think there's a good analogy with the creation of the spreadsheet. So previously it was actually a thing on paper that you would draw on, and now it's an electronic template and software that supports spreadsheets. Instead, for better or worse, people have gone and built a lot more financial models and then used it for other purposes. Like the, the, the work tasks evolve. Hopefully, the, the idea is hopefully it will take out the drudgery and let us focus on the high value tasks. And certainly if you talk to the evangelists, that's what they say is that it's enabling us to do more with the tools that we have. Um, and the spreadsheet is a really good example of that because it really was that sort of sheet of paper with things spread all over it. So, and very hard to recalculate. Yeah, I mean, obviously the transition is, the question is how do you manage the transition? So um, I, I think this is right that the, the profession or the, the job in the US that has the most people doing it is driving still. Um, and so you think, well, again, if self-driving cars and trucks and, you know, trains and so on become a become prevalent, well, you know, the thing that people do most for work stops being done. And obviously that creates a huge discontinuity for lots of people um, uh, that needs to be managed. But uh, to me that's more of a public policy, more of a kind of a normal type of problem that societies deal with rather than an existential threat. So essentially we're going to move from being fearful of what jobs might disappear to more about helping to transition into other things. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Um, well, as I hope, I know that everyone has been putting questions in because I can see them, but there is one critical thing I think we really need to cover and it's the implications for risk management. And we have alluded to this a bit. Um, are the risks with using AI and finance different than the current risks? in finance or is it just redistributed? So coming back to my earlier point around people having very high expectations for generative AI, um, there are a lot of risks in the way that banks and other financial institutions operate today. Part of the problem for generative AI, I think, is that people are hoping for kind of tech-like reliability from a system that's actually trying to behave like a person rather than thinking about it like a, a stand-in person or a proxy person. So in all of the organizations, we have frontline staff, we have their managers, we have escalation processes, we have complaints processes, all to manage the fact that people at the front line make mistakes. But uh, look, somehow we're saying the system has to be perfect, which is like, we should treat it like a kind of highly energetic and eager employee and work out when does it work well, when does it not work well, how do we put the right system in place that mirrors, I think, what we have for people. Yeah, I th I did maybe I, I add, I think the, um there is an interesting risk of um, over-reliance on the tool or, you know, maybe it's kind of the flip side of what you're saying, Julian, but, but um, a, a combination of that over-reliance and then um, expecting to understand how it works when it's at some level unknowable. So if it's making credit decisions or underwriting decisions for an insurance company, how do you ensure that there isn't bias in, you know, racial bias or some other bias in the the way that it's in inverted commas thinking you know we're quite good at sort of understanding you know is another person biased but I think we have less of a track record of figuring out whether a, 
an algorithm's biased or not. I think it's the same point, though, because to figure out if someone else is biased, you look at what they're doing, right? What's their actions? What's the outputs? You can yeah, do the, the, same the risk would be that we don't look at what it's doing because we think it's a machine and therefore it's um, infallible. And a lot of that comes down to the programming, doesn't it? This is how is this actually set up in the first place and what guardrails are put on there? And there's a lot of discussion about what sort of guardrails should be there and ha have they been successful or not? Um, what's your experience of that, Julie? I mean, it's very clearly it's a very quickly evolving space. Uh, I mean, the output, you know, like OpenAI spends a huge sum of money trying to train the algorithm not to output hate speech, racist speech, bias, all that sort of stuff. So, like, that's part of the service offering that they have. You know, is they're trying to sell something which is high quality as an algorithm, which at least attempts to deal with those problems. Yeah, I think also that the business processes haven't caught up with the technology. So, an example I saw recently was a, um, you know, for example, um, when a, um, if there's a disruption uh, for an airline, for example, you know, something goes wrong, there's a storm in one airport, has massive flow on consequences for thousands of people across the network, staff and customers and all kinds of things, the airport itself. Um, you, when that happens, there just aren't enough people working at, for example, the airline or the airport to individually message every single person that's been involved in that event. Um, and so what happens today is people just don't know what's going on or, you know, the platinum frequent flyers know what's going on because they get a call and then everybody else doesn't know what's going on. Um, so in that situation, the the counterfactual to an AI-driven thing that might actually be wrong, the alternative is nothing. So it's probably going to be better than nothing. Um, and so I think, you know, that to me would be an example where I would say, look, just so long as customers know that what's going on, I'd say we'll kind of go for it. Um, try to constrain it in a way so that, you know, customers only ask you know, where is my bag or what's the next flight? They don't ask, you know, should I get divorced? Or, you know, like, you know, it can go crazy. Um, so I, anyway, those sort of situations I would see, probably there's little downside. The alternative is zero, so it's, you know, going to be better. Um, but then I think in other more complex things, um, particularly where there's some kind of ethical dimension to it, I think we just need to be a bit careful. And it's that taking care which is going to need the interventions up front and being aware of all the possibilities of what could be used. And as you said, Julian, banks never do things which don't have unintended consequences. So, I mean, to, to Sam's point here about stuff not getting done, like there's a lot of compliance by committee in banks where people sit around and talk about processes. What you actually want is the compliance process actually tightly integrated into the operational process. So as an example, um, you know, when customers call in, uh, banks go and do, they select a sample of calls and go and listen to them for quality assurance purposes. Actually, with generative AI, you can fairly easily have it sit across 100% of the calls and check that all of the agents are compliant with all of the policies all the time. So actually, this is a direct tool to better risk management by something that's more scalable than having people sample things. Yeah, and, and sampling is a very difficult process. I haven't done it on a... Um, now, we do have some great questions uh, that have come up, um, and so I will start asking them. So um, I will pass them to both of you. Um, the, the top rated one at the moment is, as AI, AI takes over certain roles in finance, what new job roles do you foresee emerging? I think I know the answer to this. Well, I mean, the obvious one is a prompt engineer. Um, in most cases, I think general management is just a form of prompt engineering. Mostly people like people at a certain level in a company don't actually do any work themselves. They're mostly just asking other people the answer to questions and then, you know, through judgment or analysis coming up with a view of whether that's the right answer or not. So um, I actually think, and I think we, we discovered this when we ran that experiment on, on our own um, people, that the ability to ask good questions just becomes more and more important. I mean, it's important now. It will be more important in the future. So it's actually a very human skill is to ask the right questions and know when to right ask questions, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a long, there's a long history of, you know, repetitive jobs get increasingly done by machines and what's left is the essence of human creativity and judgment. And to me, that just becomes more and more important in a relative sense the more that machines take away the things that don't require that. 
And I guess it's similar to how if you ask an AI image generator to generate you images, it will give you a number of images, but someone has to check which one or select which one they like the best or matches it. So the generative AI will clearly reduce a fair bit of the manual work that's required, but it's hard to find examples where it will take everything. So there's an example of a car insurance company in the US called uh, Jerry, and they uh, their call center was not very digitized. Um, they had a team of about kind of a project manager and six people over a couple of months develop um, a solution, basically a kind of chatbot type solution to try and deal with problems ahead of the call center. Uh, it, it reduced the contact volumes quite a lot by about 70%. That's not typically what you would expect. It reflects their low level of digitization initially. But the interesting part is that um, the, the calls that were remaining went from about 5% edge cases to 100% edge cases, which actually the agents hate, frankly. And a lot of them said, this is not like not a fun job anymore. I'm having to work much harder than, I've, than I have before. So like, no, no one thinks that somehow you're going to get rid of the call center. Uh, people think in the next two years you might get rid of 50% of contact volumes. Maybe there's a pathway to 60 70%, 80%. 80%. But the hard cases are the ones actually where you're going to need the human input, I think. So uh, the number of jobs might change, but I don't think it's getting rid of jobs, like job titles anytime soon. It, can I just um, there was a group of academics did some research on VCG consultants using, using um, chat GPT. And there were some really interesting findings, I thought, which is... Um, so that the the median performance on a given task increased, which you'd expect. Um, the performance increase was highest from the people that were less, the, the you know the least competent at the task or least experienced to start with. Um, but the variability of um, the performance or the answer to a question was massively reduced. And so what what these researchers found is. In a, in a team environment where different people will come at a problem from different directions and ideally together form something that's, you know, greater than the sum of the parts, actually the performance of the team could deteriorate significantly as a result of each of the team members' individual performance increasing, which is sort of counterintuitive. But I actually think there's something in it. And so the other part of that is the... the the people that were best able to use the tool um, well were the people who had previous experience of delegating tasks to other people because they were good at explaining what they wanted and then validating what they got back. And I, I, I think there's something in, in that. I think there's something of, the fla of that flavour. The companies that can figure out where does it improve things because we don't want variability and we frankly don't care about how creative something is, but not going so far that you then lose the spark of what it was that made, say, your company successful in the first place. It's a really fascinating example of, of the how things can develop once you start using a tool like this. Yeah, no, that's great, thank you. Um, now, we did have another question here, which I think is really interesting. Where do you draw the line between use and abuse of AI in finance? So, uh, I mean, the regulatory space here is evolving quickly. The EU is the model jurisdiction for all of this. There are a set of use cases that are classified there based on how risky they are. So things like credit decisioning uh, is a kind of a high vigilance use case. It's not saying don't use AI, but it needs a whole set of checks that's put in there. Things like law enforcement uh, fall into that category. Um, things involving vulnerable people which could be because they're a member of a particular class or because they're financially disadvantaged. So uh, there's already good thinking on this topic around where are the traps and where, where do you need to be careful. Um, I mean, the, the, again, the challenge here, I think, is that the question is what's the status quo? Because actually we know that many of the status quo processes are sort of good but not amazing, and this is an opportunity to improve them. If we can convince ourselves actually there's kind of, you know, on balance the benefits are right, having regard to the circumstances, that's a, that's a good thing, I think. The risk will be that people hold it to some kind of artificially high standard that's not the same standard that we hold the current process to. Yeah, look, I, I'd agree. I think there's a, there's a, the answer to that question depends, I think, a bit on your perspective. So if you think your objective as a bank or insurance company or wealth manager is, is some kind of Hippocratic oath of first do no harm, 
then the bar gets set really high, actually. Um, if your objective is, for example, if you said 50% of Australians could benefit from financial advice, 90% um, of that 50% won't pay for it, uh, therefore the alternative is that people just make decisions randomly or they get ripped off, um, and therefore even if a few people suffer, on average people will be better off. You know, it's a bit the flight disruption um, example. I Honestly, I think that's that's an a philosophical, ethical question, not a technology question. And and bank boards, for example, will come at it much more from the angle of first do no harm and much less from the angle of, you know, as a society we should be aiming for the average to be um, increased. And I guess one of the problems is that um, it's kind of rare for a bank to go out there to abuse people using AI. It's more likely it's going to be an unintended consequence or something that, that happens or uh, it gets used in a certain way that they weren't intending. So that sort of tends to suggest, you know, it goes back to your comment about the board. You know, do you see financial firms as having the skill sets at C-suite and board level necessarily to properly govern and oversee the use of AI? I mean, I'd, I, no would be the answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> We're sort of qualified. No, I, again, this is like sort of everyone has their own sort of experience. I actually think that we shouldn't expect directors of banks or insurance companies to be technology experts. I just think that's an unrealistic expectation. But I think we do. We should expect those people to thoughtfully engage on the um, ethical, operational, and strategic implications of decisions and. Um, I honestly haven't seen as much of that as as you might hope. I, I think you know a lot of there's over reliance on you know perceived experts and not enough um, sort of deep interrogation of what it actually means, unfortunately. And is that something where there needs to be assistance provided to help the boards get across this? I'm sure that's the case. I'm I don't, sure I actually BCG don't, can help. No, no, I actually don't know what that's. I actually don't know what the solution is to that problem. It's it, it's actually it's an example of a broader problem. Actually, um, how do you balance having enough information that you're not just randomly making decisions on a on a group? I mean, it's a bit the question. The, the problem I was describing before with BCG consultants of kind of you know converging on a mean. Um, if if boards are just totally reliant on an expert then they're just getting one view and that's not their job. Um, I, I don't know, Julian, if you've got a different view. I mean, somehow I think the whole AI term has got stigma attached to it or risk of, un, risk of the unknown. Like if you just say it's a box and it's got inputs and it's got outputs, how do you validate that it works within certain circumstances? Banks are pretty good at doing that if they want to on their own existing processes. So they just, I think people need to get the kind of AI mystique out of their head and just treat it as a process which might be fallible under some circumstances. Try and work out what those circumstances are, try and shepherd it away from those, have the right processes in place. Unfortunately, the regulators won't, I don't think will take this view, but that's the policy question. And you kind of need to keep an eye on it on a regular basis as well to see that it is doing what it says on the tin. I, mean, I made the point about agents before, right? Like trying to review them. I mean, like theoretically agents could go off the rails and abuse customers. You know, there's processes to deal with that. Yep. So I think it's honestly the exact same problem. Yeah, it is much more, it's much more than just a straight machine learning thing. Yeah. Actually, the one thing I'd say is, is um, I think most big companies in Australia should be at least experimenting and doing it in a controlled way. So if it goes wrong, it's not the end of the world. Um, so if there are companies that are basically thinking this is all too scary and too hard, I'm just not going to do anything. I don't think that's the right answer. But experiment in a way that you get useful information from the experiment, not just we're going to try six cool things and then randomly decide which of the six we're going to do at the end of it. You know, have some evaluation process and criteria, which I, honestly I haven't seen companies put in place so far. There is a reporting bias here. So, uh, I mean, there's basically three use cases for generative AI. There's revenue, there's cost or productivity and risk. The revenue stuff often is quite customer facing. The cost stuff is often more internal facing. Um, I promise you that people are talking in the papers, as you can, like you can go and find the articles about 
how they're using it for improving the productivity of coders or other internal things. No one is saying in you know putting out press statements saying, hey, we've got a Gen AI chatbot live in market because it puts a target on you. So what people are actually doing and what they are saying are not necessarily the same thing. Which leads us to regulation. Everyone is talking AI regulation, but where should regulation start? What would be most important piece of AI regulation for governments to put in place? Along those lines, should we have a sandbox? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I've got the answer here, but having talked to a number of governments and government agencies around Australia at both the federal and state level, uh, if I can summarise the conversation, it's sort of, uh, oh shit, unfortunately the technology is so, going to be so useful, we're going to be forced to use it ourselves at some point. So we have to start experimenting now to get comfortable with it. So this is, uh, unlike other things, it's not an instance, I think, where they can sort of um, dismiss the problem and say, it's sort of, you know, it's a private sector problem. Like they're, like once the benefits start appearing in the private sector, they're going to demand that, well, citizens will demand it from the public sector as well. So there are very active experimentation programs going on across many government agencies, also to try and work out when does the technology work, when does it not work, what's the trajectory that it's on. I know that doesn't answer your question, but I think they're thinking about it very actively. Yeah, look, I, th I think it's a bit like um, company directors. Um, getting started in a controlled way, I think, is, is important. It's the same with... Um, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, for example, you know, pretending it doesn't exist is not useful. Um, equally, just having a free-for-all is not useful. Um, so, you know, having smart people think through what's what's the logical next step that's the least risky and will get us to the next step, I think is probably the right approach. And it's probably fair to say that no one has the right answer right now. So it's one that is going to involve a lot of discussions. And, I mean, I know in the UK there's a discussion going on right now. And so we're seeing different reactions. You mentioned the EU. They've already come out and been quite specific, as they always are. Um, the US has got an executive order and the UK is having a conversation. So it kind of sort of tells you that there's no one really has the right answer. Yeah, I think the, um, the I mean, AI has been around for a long time. So in, in, in some ways it's, you know, ethical uses of AI. I, I imagine those frameworks can be applied to generative AI in the way that they have been applied for a number of years. In my experience with particularly finance, and I know there's a former regulator here who probably agree, the, the most pertinent question that a regulator can ask is, do you understand what this is doing? Excellent. Um, so we've got actually a heap of questions, and I'm going to apologise to everyone right now. We are not going to get through all of these, um, but they are some really good ones. Um, here's a very quick one. Which Australian companies are leading the way in AI? What are the main constraints for AI in Australia outside of computing power um, or access to tech? Any clues? I'm going to give a dismal view and say by world standards, basically none of them are leading. Um, part of that, I think, is due to, and particularly in finance, so there are real constraints around GPU capacity in Australia. You cannot run GPT-4 or any of the large GPT models here. You have to be willing to send your data overseas. So. In banking, of course, data sovereignty and control over your data is very important. So actually, even if you're really enthusiastic in finance, uh, there's quite severe constraints at the moment. Those will open up. People are experimenting with simpler models, which require less compute that can be run here. But um, I mean, honestly, like a lot of the conversations I've had this year have gone along the lines of, uh, in finance or banking, people have said, this is going to be very disruptive in the medium term, but there's a lot of cost pressure in the short term and I've got other fires to put out. Uh, no one else seems to be moving quickly and, and very importantly, we didn't budget it for it this year because it came out of the blue. So it's a next year problem. Uh, I know this sort of goes against everything about kind of like NPV and profit maximisation, all that sort of stuff, but um, honestly, it's kind of like, you know, minimise cost for, you know, good profit is currently what's on everyone's mind, not, not just suddenly invest in something that's come up because it might be disruptive. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't think Australian banks are at the forefront, but maybe they shouldn't be. You know, maybe maybe it's better for things to work. Maybe it's better to figure out so that something doesn't work somewhere else. Like I don't think I don't think we can be miles behind, but equally, maybe not being at the front is also not such a bad thing. Being at the leading edge here probably is not the best thing. Yeah, the Stephen Bradbury approach, yeah. I think, is what we should be aiming for. We so are good at yeah. that. 
I've heard many, many times from our clients, like, I want to be a fast follower, not an innovator. Um, <laughs> like, everyone wants to be second. Um, the, the problem with this, like, it's, it's fair enough, right? Like you say, it's an experimental technology. We don't want to waste our money on it. The challenge will be the assumption there is that suddenly there'll be a kind of tipping point and you'll just be able to jump on the bandwagon and switch it on very easily and everything will be kind of fine. Practically, the technology is evolving quickly and will continue to evolve to get the benefits on many of the use cases. It actually has to be quite tightly integrated into operations. So even if even when you reach the point, so, okay, great, we're going to get going, it's still going to be you know, months to start seeing any benefit and years for maturation. So... Often our clients are experimenting for this reason. So it's not like they're investing hard, but they're also trying not to fall behind from a knowledge perspective. Go, sir. Uh, look, the, the, other, the other pitfall, I think, is the sort of letting a thousand flowers bloom approach. Yeah. And, and a number of companies, you know, are doing that, which is basically to say, look, because we don't really know where this is headed and because everyone seems to be saying it's important, we're just going to sort of create some fun spray money around semi-randomly to different parts of the organisation, you know, run so-called experiments. And they're not really experiments because they haven't been set up in a way that you could learn anything from the result of the activity. So they've created activity, not experiments. Yep. And actually, I think that might in some ways set some companies back because some of those things will have adverse consequences they didn't expect and then they'll retreat. I, in general, I think there's a lack of just clear thinking, honestly, mm. on the topic. And there's a lot more that has to be done before everyone's ready to actually take first steps. Yeah, so it's fine to be it's fine to take small first steps if they're if you're doing that deliberately. Um, but taking a hundred small first steps simultaneously is not going to lead you towards whatever the outcome is that you want to get to. Excellent. And we have a student of financial history out here who says, How does this differ from the AI trends in nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties? Um, sorry, I remember that. Remember the fifth gen project in Fat Japan and fuzzy logic washing machines. Remember long term capital management connection machines. Have we seen all this before? Have we seen all this before? I mean, long term capital management was a bunch of very smart people who used their models under the wrong circumstances. Like, the, I don't think that's the right reference. Um, I mean, I think the, the real surprise here has been as we've seen the evolution of neural networks and the transformers that underpin. Uh, the latest generative AI, the quality has been improving, but I think everyone has been a bit taken aback by just how big the jump is in how well it performs. Because basically what these models are doing is they've hoovered up the whole internet. So kind of Wikipedia, Reddit, forums, um, newspapers, etc. And all it's doing is saying, given a block of text, what is the next word that is most likely to occur? Then sort of staple that back onto the first one then predict the next word and then repeat the process kind of one word at a time. And amazingly, it seems to turn out that if you do this, you can say, like, write me a poem about a haiku about how I love finance and, you know, you get something great or you paste in physics problems and it works very well. So um, people have... This follows the same path that Google has followed before in terms of kind of sucking up all of the images on the internet and getting an algorithm to try and automatically classify it. So it's been data-driven rather than logic-driven, uh, sort of you know, implicit. Um, the, the problem is it's very hard to know actually how it works, but empirically it seems to work actually very well. So I mean, there's also, a, um, and this is a, maybe a bit of a tangent, but I, I think there is a history over the last 20 years or so, um, you can see it in media and telco in particular, of industry structures moving from a, you know, a value chain where kind of this leads to that leads to that. And, you know, in a manufacturing sense, for example, your ability to predict customer demand and then communicate that back up the chain to the manufacturing facility, you know, that sort of efficiency in that sense is what allowed some companies to win and others not. The structure of industries, though, comes to resemble, you know, through computing power, through ubiquitous data, comes to resemble the technology itself. So if you think about, you know, the way media or telco is structured now, it's all been kind of discombobulated into different layers um, that have different economics and compete in different, you know, compete with types of companies that they didn't compete with before. Um, 
I think that's probably true of most transformative technologies and on the assumption that this is an example of a transformative technology, then in some way industry structures would change. I honestly don't know how they'll change, um, but to me that's the sort of the interesting structural question. So, for example, if if the basis of competition for an insurance company changes from having 100 years of data about, you know, how often different types of people crash different types of cars, if that changes to um, access to the sensors that are in cars in real time and in some way being able to predict or even stop a crash, you could end up with, for example, um, activities that previously were done by insurers being done by the manufacturers of cars. Now, I don't know if that'll happen. It might. But I think that's the interesting sort of strategic question that might get posed by this. And we have time for one last um, very philosophical question. Uh, what will the industry look like in 2100? What future is AI helping shape and where is it heading? So I, I have a theory that, ba that banks have basically done, and, and actually insurance companies, have basically been doing the same thing for hundreds of years. Um, so I, I had a client years and years ago, um, Scottish widows, for anyone who's oh, yeah. been to the UK, they claim to have invented insurance, which is a pretty good claim for an insurance company. Um, and more or less what they were doing, I don't know how many hundreds of years later, was the same basically is what they started doing. So I, and I think that's probably true of banking, you know, transform risk, make payments. Um, some people want to save money. Some people want to spend money they don't have. I, I, at that level, I actually think it's probably not going to change. Um, there'll probably be fewer people doing it. Um, that might be a good thing. Um, but, but might but, be some more accuracy. Yeah, but well, but fundamentally, I, I just think that role that there is a need in our society for the institutions that we today call banks and insurance companies, and I, I don't think that role fundamentally will change. Julian, I agree with Sam. I think there'll probably be fewer people on a proportionate basis. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 such an interesting question, right? Like. What you see with much of the technology to your productivity point, Sam, about um, the last 30 years or so, a lot of it has been taking out all sorts of frictions that exist. So if you went back to 2005 and said, hey, by the way, around the corner, there's, you're going to have a, a phone in your pocket and like, you'll be able to use it to call a taxi and this is going to take the world by storm. Everyone said, well, I can already call a taxi. Like what's, what's like what's the problem? But then people realise you know taxis don't turn up sometimes. Actually, being able to see where the taxi is has quite a lot of utility. Um, you know, it opens up uh, you know ride sharing or drivers on the other end to increase supply. So actually, the net package in the form of Uber is very attractive. But it would would have been quite hard to articulate just how like if you tried to put it as a sales pitch in two thousand, everyone would have just said like, great, I don't I don't get it. Um, There's so, another dimension to this, um, and again, maybe this is a tangent, but Retail banking, at least, is already radically different in different places in the world. So if you take um, like the, the average Australian retail bank, you compare that to the average regional bank in the US, you compare it to a really good bank in Western Europe, and then you compare it to the most efficient bank in a, you know, a emerging economy or, you know, some other market. Um, I, I at least find this interesting. The, the European bank will have roughly half as many people as the Australian bank serving the same number of customers and doing basically the same thing. There are some markets in the world, so Poland, for example, or Korea or whatever, there are banks that are twice as efficient as the most efficient Western European banks, so that's four times more efficient than Australian banks. And if you go to the US, they're roughly 50% less efficient than the Australian banks. So already there is this. So if you, so, a client of mine has this joke of like, if you want to see um, the future of banking, go to Western Europe. If you want to see the past of banking, go to the US. Um, and probably actually Japan is probably even further in the past. I just don't know it well enough. Um, so I, there is already a massive difference. So to your question about like how many people will be working in banking, for example, already today the technology exists to do banking with half or 
a quarter the number of people that Australian banks have. And they have been progressively reducing their staff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's mostly those processing roles that have been disappearing. Yes. Well, um, thank you, everyone, for these wonderful questions. Um, and there are about actually about 20 questions that I haven't asked. So um, that's a really good effort. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you to Sam and Julian for um, joining us today. Now, if we could just circle back to our networking question. Um, what has everyone selected? I actually can't see it, Melon. <laughs> As long as you don't say it's like a management consultant just making things up on the fly. <laughs> I think it is. Which one is it? Chef. chef. Okay, so AI, AI and finance is like a chef. Um, that's an interesting illusion. So um, please, um, if you, as we go out today, please, as you go to the drinks, find someone that you maybe don't know um, and have a chat to them about the results here and whether you think AI and finance is a chef magician or something else so once again thank you everyone thanks everyone for your questions and we'll now move to the networking phase so thank you